Hello, everybody. Today, again, we have uh, Yanni and Shantana with us, uh, and we're going to talk about time dimension in streaming data, which is a very interesting and also very complex topic. Um, so Yanni and uh, Shantana, would you like to do a quick intro for our new audience here? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yanni. I'm the CTO of Absolver. Hi, everyone. I'm Shantana. I'm the product manager for developer experience at Absolver. Great. All right. So let's uh, start our exciting session today. Uh, and uh, Yoni, I think um, time dimension and how time works and how data architecture works is really interesting for a lot of our audience. I'm thinking maybe we should start with um, maybe just give a quick overview of how Lambda architecture worked um, previously on Data Lake and some of the issues uh, with uh, syncing the time, syncing the data that you see in the past. Uh, would you elaborate on that a little bit before you go into the details? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so let's just uh, first of all let's frame the problem, uh, and and we'll try to I'll try to keep this as simple as possible. But it's a bit of a complex topic, so so uh, uh, excuse me if we get a bit into the weeds. Um, so let's talk about time and data. Um, normally, like when you think about time, it's okay. You have a timestamp and you're done. Like there's a timestamp in your in your record, whatever it is. Um, but actually in streaming data, um, and also in batch data for that matter, the, the, the concept of time is a, bit, a little bit more complicated. You don't have a single timestamp that represent, fully represents uh, what's going on. So, so let's talk about it kind of from the beginning to the end. Um, the first timestamp that you might want to associate with your data was when it was produced. So this data was uh, produced by some kind of a, a system that's writing files, let's say, to S3. Um, so this timestamp might be proxied by the uh, maybe the last modified of the file on S3, or maybe it's an event time that's written into each row. Um, this timestamp might also be delayed. Uh, so it could be that I'm writing the file now, but actually the data came from earlier than that. Um, and it's also possible that I did something tricky, like maybe I have all my data in the lake, and it was written out. And then at some point, someone decided that this isn't the right uh, folder structure. It's not in the right bucket. So I'll just copy over all the files uh, into a new bucket. And, and then the last modified gets updated in all the files. But I mean, the data was already there. It didn't change. It didn't inherently change uh, what time this data represents. So, so this first time, I would call this like kind of the event time, um, or this is like kind of the the real world time of when the events actually occurred in, in reality. And we're trying to approximate that, right? So like using the last modified of the file is obviously not when the events occurred, but maybe it happened close enough uh, unless someone copied the data over. Um, but at least as a concept, we're talking about um, when the data in fact occurred. Um, and, and this is a very messy time. It can be out of order. You can suddenly get late events. There's a lot of a lot of complexity around that. Um, and that matters a lot. So let's say I'm doing uh, aggregates per day and I wanna aggregate based on the event time. So, I mean, normally uh, I, would, I would kind of say, well, I'll just aggregate data as it arrives and flush it into the current day. And, and then when the day ends, I'll move on to the next. But if I can get late events because the event time can happen in the past, um, I need to update previous aggregates. Uh, and I, I don't know, how, how far back can this data happen? Like, can it happen years back or is it just happening in the last few days? So there's, there's a lot of um, kind of dynamic questions I need to answer around what's going on when I'm using this event time that, that happened sometime in the past. Um, now, this is kind of the, the first timestamp that I'm going to be dealing with. But then there's a second timestamp, which is my, I mean, in a database, this would be the commit time. So I, when the data was actually written to the system, um, and this is also very important because like when you think about a database, for example, um, I, let's say I'm doing a join between two tables, I'm necessarily only gonna see the data that was already committed to the table. And at the same time, I'm gonna see all the data that was committed to the table up until this point. Um, so essentially I'm doing a join where I'm looking at the other table and at my table based on the commit time, like all the data that was committed, I see, and data that wasn't committed yet, I don't see. Um, so the commit time is very important in the sense that let's say I do a join and the data to my second table wasn't committed yet because there was a delay in the stream feeding into it. Um, I'm not gonna see it. The join isn't gonna succeed. 
Um, so I need to kind of make sure um, somehow that my data is synchronized. And this commit time is very important because that's the data that exists in my, in my system. And that's the data I'm going to see. Um, now, when we're talking about an ETL process, that becomes even more complicated because maybe I wrote my staging data into the first table uh, and it has a commit time. And then I do a transformation and write it to a second table uh, and maybe enrich it. And now that data is not committed at the same time. It's committed a bit later. Um, so there's a bit of a lag between the commit to the first table and the commit to the second table. And maybe a lot of lag because maybe my system's down or maybe I'm doing a database maintenance or something like that. There might be even hours uh, between the two commit times. And so as I progress in the ETL, I have a lot of commit times that get associated with my event, which when you're talking again about a database or a data warehouse where it's kind of implicit, they wouldn't have actual commits, but it's still like, you know, I wrote the data, now it appears. Um, I, I need to think about, does the data that I'm trying to access already exist? And also, will I be getting too much data? Will maybe I'm going to join into a state that's already evolved further than, than, than the current record expects. And maybe I'm getting more information than what I, what I was hoping for in this, uh, in this event. So I'm kind of in a, when you're talking about a normal traditional database world or data warehouse, you're not synchronizing between the streams that are writing the different tables. They're just kind of each is progressing and filling in the tables and, and each joins and gets whatever information there is. Um, now, a lot of systems have started coming out with the concept of time travel. Um, so I can tell the system, I want to join into the table at a specific timestamp. Um, now, you have to keep in mind, though, that that timestamp is, is based on the commit times. So it might have a different meaning and it might contain different data depending on the upstream systems and how many hops I have within the ETL. So this, it becomes, let's say, very complicated, like hunting down where all the data is that's actually relevant or when all the data is that's actually relevant to me becomes uh, not only a chore, but, but there's just a lot of moving parts involved that can really affect kind of the correctness of my joins. Um, I'm going to pause here for a second because uh, I think this was already a lot. Um, are there any, any questions? For the sake of uh, maybe so somebody might be new looking at this, is that um, I think, um, you know, um, commit time, understand the difference between commit time and event time is uh, very important, right? Like, uh, I think a lot of the folks uh, might have some, um, you know, maybe the analysts will mostly qualify the event time in their queries, but then they don't quite understand when the data is written. So perhaps when that, when they qualify the event time, but not really worrying about the commit time, they still get the wrong answers. Um, basically when they when they when they run the queries so we always like uh, back then in the data warehouse days we always talked about like uh, when somebody withdraws something or deposits something in the atm that's an event but how when does it make it to a data warehouse and that's the commit and you can't get the right amount unless you can, uh, make sure both when the person deposits the check versus when that data is written to the data um, database we all we need to, to take both of them under consideration when we do processing basically um, so i think that's how i understand yeah. It. yeah is is there a sense of um approximating what the delay would be between creation and or event and commit times for you know obviously it would be different based on the process that was actually being carried out but is it is it useful do people try to approximate it ahead of time so it's not only useful, it's necessary in a lot of cases. So first of all, um, you know, often when I have a very late event, I'm going to be doing a lot of extra work. I mean, this is also true for a batch process. Imagine I get a new batch of data and almost all the data is from today, but a bit of it is from yesterday and a tiny bit of it is from two days ago. And like there's a super long tail that's actually going to end up updating my entire data lake. Um, so that's clearly not going to be performant. I mean, I kind of need to cut it off and say at some point, well, okay, this event is too late. I don't want to go ahead and update. So, so one thing is, is that you, you have to think about like, at what point is the data no longer relevant? Is it too old for me to even consider useful? And I'm just going to filter it out. Um, but then of course you might want to reason about that differently. If you get a giant bulk of data from three years ago and you want to go ahead and feed that in. So that, uh, obviously is going to have kind of different rules. I mean, it's a three year delay, but, but I'm updating a small portion of the data lake. So maybe it's fine. Um, 
So definitely you need to be thinking about kind of how old is your data and how old makes sense for your data. Um, I mean, also, uh, I mean, commit times should always be ahead of event times. I mean, there's never a situation where an event happens in the future and I've already committed it. Um, but in reality, these things happen. You're going to get events that are coming from the future because of time zone issues or because of some stray uh, uh, operation that, that increased the, the date by, by a lot or whatever it is. Um, so you also need to reason about that. Do you want to discard data that's from the future? Um, do you want to write it into today? Or are you going to end up having a bunch of partitions that are, that are you know, from the year 9999 um, that, that has a bunch of data in it that, that you're just not looking at? Um, so that's another thing that you need to be thinking about in the, in the relationship between the event time and the commit time. Um, another important thing to think about is just the relationship between the event time and the event times around it. So if I have a stream of events, and let's say I have a chunk of data. I have 100,000 records that I want to deal with. I want to have a way to reference those 100,000 events. And if I made a mistake or if I want to replay or if I want to do something, I would need a way to then reference it again in the same way. Um, and event times don't give me that because they can come from the past. They, they're, they're interspersed between batches. Um, so, so really when you're thinking about... Um, when you're thinking about event times, which, which can be all sorts of things, and then you have the commit time, which is when you wrote it to the table, there's actually a third time in the middle, which is kind of like, a, I would call it a monotonically inc increasing event time. So, so it's kind of like, I want it to be as close to the event time as possible because I want my aggregates to be correct and I want everything to work correctly um, to return as close to the correct results as possible. But at the same time, I want to be able to uh, to reason about when this data came from. And I want, like, given a time, I want to be able to go to a specific place in my lake and pick it up. Um, and then, so creating that time, which is kind of like a combination, it's going to uh, try to be the event time as much as possible. But at the same time, I don't want to start writing data back in time um, because that means that I'm not going to be able to find it later when I'm looking for it easily. Um, so so kind of having the the time force uh, monotonicity on top of the event time, but at the same time, try to be the event time if possible. Um, and this is kind of a very important concept in Upsolver and how Upsolver handles uh, handles data and makes all sorts of guarantees on uh, um, on on, on uh, idempotency and and how how your ETL is going to work and exactly one's consistency uh, comes from this monotonically increasing event time like time field uh, that we're going to use in a lot of different spots in our in our ETL. Um, sorry, that was a long answer to a short question. Um, it's a any other questions or, or complicated yeah. questions? Maybe like in the next, uh, I think there's another one that's really important in this uh, area is total ordering as well. So I think uh, maybe uh, maybe it's a discussion for next time. But I think uh, you know writing everything in order is also incredibly important based on these uh, these timestamps. Basically, yeah. Yeah, I was I was gonna yeah, ask absolutely. Like, is there a sense of like concurrent events or something uh, like, you know, we sort of know that these, you know, set of events are supposed to be um, created or emitted at the same time. Do we like group them together, even if they're sort of, you know, out of step? So, I mean, there is um, in most streaming systems, um, you're going to have a concept of a partition. So if you're looking at Kafka or Kinesis or Event Hub or, all of these, they have the concept of a partition. And uh, so your data goes into a lot of different partitions, let's say like 100 partitions, 200 partitions, and data is strongly ordered within the partition. So you could say that if data got into Kafka in a certain partition, um, and it's before or after, there's a ordering between those. So, so they wouldn't be concurrent in the sense that you always have a strong ordering between the events. But between partitions, you don't really have a statement about what happened first. So there you could say that, uh, that between partitions, you're kind of dealing with concurrent data um, that, that you don't, I mean, and, and this is in fact, like when you're trying to do identity operations, this is a problem because, um, because it matters the order that you process the data. Uh, not all operations are, are sums, uh, maybe to take a last version or something. 
And then which is the last version might depend on which partition I processed earlier. And since Kafka doesn't make any statement about which is first, um, I don't really have necessarily built in a deterministic way to ensure that I'm getting the data uh, in this, consistently in the same order. Um, and the data lake is very important for that because in the data lake, I kind of have this long-term storage, which is write once. Um, so you have the opportunity, even if you're taking it from a system like Kafka, which isn't guaranteeing any kind of like strong ordering between partitions, once it lands in the data lake, if you play your cards right, if you do it the right way, um, you can create a total ordering over all your data, as as May was as May was uh, uh, referring to, and that's very important for later on operations where I want to either find the data or I want to replay the data, or I just want to make sure that if I run two operations on the data, I'm going to get to the same the, to the same results. Great, yeah. So thank you, Yoni. Okay. Let's uh, move on to um, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about streaming to <laughs> streaming um, time dimensions if that's okay with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, okay, so so again, so we were talking about uh, event times and we we're talking about commit times, and these two times have have very different meanings, but they're both. Uh, let's say if I'm taking the kind of the monotonically increasing event time or just taking the commit time, both are monotonically increasing. I mean, commit times are always, you know, data is committed and then it's committed later. You never commit data back in time. Uh, I mean, that's kind of not, not how, how things work. Um, so both of these times are monotonically increasing. And that means that either of them gives you an opportunity to, to make sure that you're synchronizing all your work across, across kind of the full state of a, of a data lake or database or data warehouse. Um, if you're the default kind of the one that like all databases support all data warehouses support is is based on commit time this is kind of just happens automatically because i'm querying on the data lake or querying on the database and i'm getting all the data that was already written um so automatically i'm kind of running my query at a certain commit time and getting all the data before then and potentially uh if i'm using time travel I can even kind of um, force it. I can say, well, uh, I want to get the snapshot of the database that existed at uh, 5.15. Um, and then uh, I want to do it again and get the snapshot of the database at 5.20 and kind of ensure that I'm being consistent across all my operations, that I'm looking at the exact same snapshot of the database. The issue is that I don't know which data that snapshot contains. It depends on a lot of things. It depends how fast my ETLs are. It depends on if my streaming systems were down or up. Um, and, and it also means that like some tables might have data in them and then other tables wouldn't have that same data because it didn't run in them yet. So I have a kind of a within the database an inconsistent state of, of where things ended up and it might not even be in the same order. So it could be that at one point in time, one table is gonna lead another. And then it, later on that they'll switch places. Um, so, so reasoning about kind of how does this database synchronize together um, is very difficult, even though I do have a consistent state. Um, in AppSolver, we have a second concept of sync jobs, which allows you to synchronize your operations based on the event time. So not the original event time, which comes out of order and you can't, like you can't suddenly go back in time uh, and do something that's older, but, um, but you can think about it as all the data in the world has a monotonically increasing time, which is similar to the event time. So if, for example, I have data being written to Kafka and maybe I'm using the Kafka timestamp, so that's when it was written to Kafka uh, as my event time. And let's say now suddenly we can't read from Kafka um, for whatever reason, there are timeouts, Kafka isn't available, it's down, uh, whatever it is. Um, we're going to stop processing. So, so the entire system kind of requires that all the data is already in for this timestamp um, for any operations to run. So we kind of need a full consistent data state up to a certain event time. We're not talking about late events. Late events are going to show up and their, their time, event time is going to be coerced to be monotonically increasing. But we're just talking about all the data streams need to have accepted all the data up to a certain point in time and then I run my operations. So what this gives me is that it's a guarantee that all the operations are gonna run where the state in all of my tables and across my entire ETL is consistent. And it has, it saw all the same data. 
Um, this is this concept is called sync jobs in Upsolver, and essentially it means that each job is going to run on an event time window instead of a commit time window. And Upsolver behind the scenes is going to ensure that all data that will ever be written to this event time window has already been written to my dependencies before I start running my jobs. And the nice thing about this is that it allows me to join between tables in a way that um, that ensures that I, I know exactly what data is going to be in both tables. And if I have a single stream that's feeding multiple tables, I can join between them. And I know that the data will have applied to all of the sources at the same time. Um, and maybe most importantly, it really helps me when I want to replay my data. Because um, now I can do an ETL or a batch process that's running on data that's very old, um, but it still has the same consistency guarantees across the data lake. Um, so, so this is a, a super useful feature that allows you to really, um, let's say, think about your data using a single timestamp. So you don't need to worry about um, event time and then commit time and then the next commit time and the next commit time and the next commit time and what the difference is between them. Um, now you have a unified timestamp and a record is going to maintain that timestamp throughout its ETL life cycle in the data lake. So a single record uh, created at 4.30 is going to have the same event time in all of the transformations that it goes through. And, and that means that I can find it very easily later on because I know it came from 4.30. If I found it in any table, I can find it in all the other tables because it has the same event time. Um, and, and also it guarantees that any operation that I do, if I'm running on 4.30, I'm going to get this event. I don't need to worry about, about uh, synchronicity within the data lake itself. Um, okay, I'll pause here. Uh, uh, again, a uh, complicated concept. Are there any questions or, or, or anything? So how do you prevent yourself from waiting forever for one of those events not having, you know, happened yet? Um, so that's an excellent question. Like, let's say, how long do you wait for late arriving data, essentially? Um, so the way AppSolver handles this is that we don't wait for late arriving data. So late arriving data is going to be coerced into an event time that's monotonically increasing. So let's take this as a, let's look at a Kafka topic. And I have an event from 4.30 and then an event after that happens at 4.31. And then an event after that happens at uh, 4.25. So this is an out of order, order event. This shouldn't happen. Kafka gives you a monotonically increasing timestamp, but you know, stuff happens. Um, what AppSolver is going to do is it's going to um, coerce the time from 425 to 431 to make sure that it is, in fact, monotonically increasing. So we're not going to wait for late events. I mean, I, I mean, this event arrives and I still have the original timestamp. So I can later on decide to do whatever I want with it. I can update old aggregates. I can like do whatever transformation I want, but it's going to be handled in the batch of data that's relevant to 4.31. And, and so the batch data that's relevant to 4.31, I'm not actually waiting. I'm just going to say, well, OK, 4.31 has arrived. All the data that's relevant to it should exist already. Let's ask Kafka what data it has. And all that data that Kafka has, let's pull it in. Now, if I can't for whatever reason, then that will cause all the downstream processes to wait. So any data that exists in my upstream system, it's the same thing for, for ETLs within Upsolver. If one transformation fails or, or is delayed or something, um, the downstream transformations are going to wait for it to finish and only run after, after it completes and successfully writes all its data to the sources which they're going to be consuming. And it's the same for reading from Kafka. Kafka's down, I'm going to wait until it comes back up, read all the data that should be there, and only then the downstream processors are going to start working. So this is kind of different from um, like when you run a query in a database, it just runs. Like you don't really have the concept of dependency data that has to be there before I start running. I can run a bunch of other queries in order to do validation on that, but like it wouldn't happen automatically. And here, rather than just running whenever I'm ready, I'm running when my data is ready. So that's kind of the main difference. That makes sense. So it's less about waiting for data uh, that should have arrived at that event timestamp and more about uh, always uh, processing data that was relevant to that time timestamp. Yeah, 
Yeah. So like the event time in the end is kind of a, an approximation. It's not like we're not using an actual event time because we're trying to enforce monotonicity. Um, so we want the numbers to always be going up. Um, so if a, an event comes from, from older times, then we want, we force it to be sooner so that, so that the order of my data will be consistent with the order that I actually consumed the data that I got it. Um, and this also, uh, leads into the total ordering of the data. So since I'm forcing the timestamps to be increasing, I can just say, well, I'm going to sort by the timestamps and some additional subfields. And this gives me a total ordering that is also the order that the data actually arrived in the system. Um, uh, because I'm coercing the timestamp to be, to be monotonic. So Yoni, did we miss anything, um, in this topic or do we address most of it? I think we covered most of it. I mean, it's, again, it's a very complicated topic. So there are a lot of, um, uh, there are a lot of things that these uh, assumptions affect. Um, so it's not like this is kind of the tip of the iceberg as far as what this does for you. Um, and we didn't really cover actual use cases. We didn't talk about like kind of what would happen now in this case in sync jobs versus unsynced jobs. Um, but I think that from a theoretical standpoint, we've covered kind of what happens behind the scenes and, and why it's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so maybe we should have a, a, a second session, um, and start talking about the use cases and also some of the, like, how are we handling observes, uh, in this architecture? And because that's super interesting, because I think a lot of people are using observes, um, for this, uh, for this kind of use cases. So Shantana, maybe we'll have a continuation, like a part two of this uh, session and talk about use cases and how we handle uh, various uh, workloads. So I think that would be really fun for folks to listen in on. Yeah. All right. So I think our 30 minutes is up for today. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to uh, speaking again with uh, all of you all in the next um, um, CTO Brownback session. Thank you, Yoni and Shantana.